On the evening of October 16, 1998, Augusto Pinochet, the former dictator of Chile, was awoken by Scotland Yard and informed that he was being arrested for crimes against humanity. Pinochet had traveled to London sometime earlier for a minor back surgery, and British and Spanish authorities, considering him a flight risk, acted quickly, placing him on immediate house arrest in his hospital bed at London Bridge Hospital. The arrest was the culmination of a year-long struggle led by Spanish judges Baltazar Garzón and Manuel García Castellón to extradite Pinochet on charges of human rights abuses against Spanish citizens in Chile and Argentina, and marked the first time in British history that a former foreign leader traveling on a diplomatic passport was apprehended on British soil. It also marked the first time in history that judges applied the law of universal jurisdiction, which allows international courts to claim criminal jurisdiction over the accused, regardless of the law where their crimes were committed. In 2000, Pinochet would be allowed to return to Chile on the grounds of ill health, and he spent the last few years of his life under house arrest, facing another possible extradition, but he'd never formally be convicted of a crime. But that he was arrested at all established a significant legal precedent, one that many legal scholars considered to be the most significant moment in international law since the Nuremberg trials, and it caused significant political and legal reverberations. After Pinochet's return to Chile, he was initially granted but then stripped of political immunity from prosecution, and under another aborted round of indictments in his home country, the Chilean Supreme Court attempted to compel the testimony of a foreign operative who helped Pinochet stage the coup that would establish his 17-year bloody reign. A former United States Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger. The Bush administration predictably bristled at this. Pinochet died a free man, and Kissinger was never asked to testify against the man he'd placed in the seat of power. But for a brief, striking moment, the precedent set by Pinochet's arrest even inspired legal proceedings in the UK against Dr. Kissinger himself in a bid to arrest him for violations of the Geneva Conventions. Welcome back to Respect the Dead. The podcast where we don't. Let's go. He's dead. Yeah, he's finally dead. Sweaty. It's no surprise that everybody celebrated your demise. And now worms are eating your eyes. So don't you worry your rotten head as you sleep in your sodden bed. smoking that Kissinger pack today. I finally, I know nothing. Uh, only because when I started seeing his name pop up, like I've always seen people being like, Kissinger's not dead yet on the internet. The meme with like the grim reaper and the mm -hmm. like gosh upon machine or whatever. Ever since he's been mentioned to me over and over again. It's because of this podcast. And I knew I wasn't going to cover him. <laughs> so every time anyone even brought him up, I'm like, spoilers. And they're like, for what? And I'm like, you wouldn't understand. You don't have a podcast like I do. <laughs> I I can't wait, Kaylin. Like, I'm so glad that, that Apparently you remained spoiler-free. Yeah. They wrote two books about him. Watch out behind I've, you. I've got a couple of books <laughs> back here. <laughs> Just at the top of the episode, I want to shout out the Behind the Bastards dollop crossover episodes of, about Kissinger. Behind the Bastards and the dollop are like our straight cis brother podcasts. They like about a year or so ago, they did like a really in-depth like six part series on Kissinger. It's like over nine hours of content. We don't have that kind of time today, so we're just going to be hitting the lowlights. So, like, if you are listening to this and you want to go, like, listen to an even deeper dive after you finish, go check out those podcasts. Also, read the two books that I read for my preparation, my notes for this. Kissinger's Shadow, which is light, breezy, you can finish it quickly. And The Price of Power, which is less so. It's a Harry Potter. Less light. 
very unbreezy. Like, <laughs> very unbreezy, <laughs> but very cunty. Like there's a lot of like Ooh. really fun, like bitchy journalists in it. It's great. Okay. So if Behind the Bastards and The Dollop are our brother podcasts, and mm. one of them is my brother and one of them is your brother, I've never listened to either. So whose brother is whomst? Ooh, I don't know. It could really go either way. There, I mean, like, I'm... Uh, we're I'm the same probably, person, so I guess it doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah, we're the same person. <laughs> They're both equally shit posty, just in different ways. I guess the dollop is, like, more Gen X-y, and uh-huh. Behind the Bastards is more millennial-y. So one of us has got, like, a way older brother, and then one of us has got, like, a brother our age. Okay, that's fair. Okay. So... How bad is this going to be? Like, what do I need to prep? Like, what what's my vibe? Oh, what Am I going to be like silly? And then for? in like five seconds, he's going to like push a orphan, a bus full of orphans into a volcano or something like there's so much that he did. Again, we're having to like breeze over a lot to fit it all okay. in that. There's at least one genocide that I had to reduce to like one sentence in the script. Mm. so that's what we've got coming content warning for all the bad stuff (sighs) okay i guess just let's just do it let's jump in the night kissinger died rolling stone released a scathing obituary titled henry kissinger war criminal dead at 100 from that (laughs) article the cubans say there is no evil that lasts a hundred years and kissinger is making a run to prove them wrong greg grandin told rolling stone not long before kissinger died there is no doubt he'll be hailed as a geopolitical grand strategist even though he bungled most crises leading to escalation he'll get credit for opening china but that was de gaulle's original idea and initiative he'll be praised for detente and that was a success but he undermined his own legacy by aligning with the neocons And of course, he'll get off scot-free from Watergate, even though his obsession with Daniel Ellsberg really drove the crime. Wait, he's Watergate adjacent? He's Watergate adjacent. We we really won't be talking about Watergate in this. Was Watergate um, the first gate? Yes. That's why everything has the gate suffix. Mm -hmm. Dope. We might talk about Watergate at some point. Watergate happened in the Nixon administration, and Henry Kissinger would be Nixon's secretary of state. Mm-hmm. So all the all the all the guys from that the whole gang thing. Men being secretaries, just queering the government. I love it. <laughs> he did queer the government. <laughs> oh, I love a girl boss. Henry Kissinger pegged so many governments. Oh. Mm-hmm. I love them all in the ass. <laughs> I love the I love when feminism is just um men, but backwards. <laughs> Yes. Henry Kissinger was born Heinz Alfred Kissinger in the village of Firth, (laughs) Germany in 1923. (laughs) I forgot. I needed to pause for laughter after telling you his real name. Uh, Spell Heinz. I like the ketchup bottle. (laughs) Yes. There, you know what? Points for that. Wait, he changed it though. Yes. If I had such an illustrious name, such as Heinz, I would never change it. It is the premier ketchup, obviously. It is the best ketchup. Like, Mm -hmm. I've got some generic ketchup in my fridge right now, and it just doesn't taste the same. No, it's off. There's something wrong about it. A little too sweet, a little too gloopy. Yeah, you... Heinz the the right texture. You know it's wrong right away, like coming into a room Mm -hmm. and like two children like when you're a kid and you like walk into a classroom and like two people stop talking it's like something's off Mm, here something's wrong henry's heinz's family was jewish and if there was a bad time and place to be born jewish germany in 1923 was certainly up there it was one of the worst why i'll let you know in a minute why what happened (laughs) (laughs) Growing up in Firth, Kissinger described regularly getting into street fights with members of the Hitler Youth. Oh, fuck. Yeah. 
<laughs> like, okay, so we're starting off real intense. <laughs> yeah. I think this is like, we won't get to spend a lot of time on his like young life. Cause again, we're having to like gloss over everything. But I mean, like, I think this is a real Shakespearean story of like a rise and fall because like he starts out being like a Jewish boy born in Germany at the time of the rise of Hitler. Yeah. And then becomes like American Secretary of State and then does awful things. It is, I mean, like the HBO series that eventually comes out about his life and does a bunch of apologia for him will be good. Like it will be good content. <sighs> They're going to make like 18 year old Henry Kissinger like so super hot. Fucking hot too. So yeah. fucking hot. <laughs> it's going to be like the gossip girlification, the CWification <laughs> of Henry Kissinger. Mm -hmm. It's going to be played by some gorgeous Australian accent. Uh, accent. <laughs> some gorgeous Australian accent. No such thing. <laughs> some gorgeous. No such thing. thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need to get like taken down a peg by some Hitler youth. <laughs> We're like. <laughs> We need to get taken down a peg by some Australians. Okay, I, to be like fair. the gauntlet is thrown, Australia. Start your own <laughs> podcast and make fun of us. Respect the bitch. The podcast where we don't. No, they they would use the C U N T Tuesday word. Mm, they would. That's their they love that word. Carn. They love misogyny in Australia. <laughs> it's one of their like most valuable exports. <laughs> misogyny big spiders <laughs> men who abuse crocodiles <laughs> those ugly ass koal no kangaroos that are like really jacked <laughs> oh yeah i hate them <laughs> i think we should kill them as a vegan i can say that <laughs> Luckily for Kissinger, he and his family managed to flee the United States when Heinz Henry was around 15 in August of 1938. Kissinger once said of the Germany of his youth, Germany of my youth had a great deal of order and very little justice. It was not the sort of place likely to inspire devotion to order in the abstract. Interestingly, his experience as a German Jew growing up under the rise of Nazism did not cause him to prefer justice without order. From Kissinger's shadow, quote, Kissinger as a diplomat is often described as amoral, as believing that values such as universal human rights have no role to play in the implementation of foreign policy. He reportedly once said, paraphrasing Goethe, that if he had to choose between justice and disorder on the one hand and injustice and order on the other, he would always choose the latter. Okay. It's a little fashy. Yeah. He grew up Just... with fascists and Mar remarked like there was a lot of fascism. And then he was like, but I still prefer that to, you know, not fascism. Right. <laughs> <laughs> at least the death trains ran on time <laughs> also like, like what a weird little false dichotomy too like why is the implication these that, are the like, only two options yeah <laughs> it, and also like isn't it wagging the dog a little bit like if you have a system that promotes the most justice wouldn't order kind of like come as a result of that like pe there would be less chaos because people would would feel like less like injustices that they would need to like yeah. fight against most people are just I, chill I if that. their circumstances, if their material circumstances are good. Most people are happy to just chill out. Most people just want to go home, make a bowl of smart popcorn. Play Stardew Valley. Put on some Stardew Valley and watch old S episodes of SVU. <laughs> like... It's so true. <laughs> bum, bum. Grandin goes on to argue that this isn't amoral, it's utilitarian. Quote, greater good can be achieved for the greatest number of people when great powers do what they need to do to create an orderly, stable, and peaceful interstate system, which in turn might nurture whatever fragile justice human beings are capable of achieving. That's what we're saying. Stardew Valley and SVU. You. Yeah. Once in the U.S., the Kissinger family settled in the neighborhood of Washington Heights in Manhattan, where young Henry would graduate from George Washington High School. But in 1943... What's the, the vibe there? Is it like affluent? Do you know? Like around the um, time? At the time, I think it was a lot of German Jewish. It was like a big okay. German Jewish neighborhood. I just heard like whenever I hear Heights, I'm like, ooh, sounds expensive. 
but oh. I guess that's not how it actually works. That's not how it actually works. Okay. I think nowadays it's probably nicer, but okay. back then it was like, yeah, it was German immigrants. Yeah. Fleeing. So yeah, I'm guessing <laughs> not with a lot to their name. Yeah. But in 1943, shortly after graduating high school and beginning his studies at City College of New York, Kissinger was drafted into the U.S. Army. As a private in the 84th Infantry Division, Henry Kissinger, who'd only escaped Germany five years before, returned to his homeland to fight the Nazis. While in the army, Kissinger is described as being discovered by a fellow German expat with Jewish ancestry, Fritz G. Kramer. Kramer was older than Kissinger. He'd already had a wife and child when the Nazis came to power, and he abandoned them to escape to America in 1939. <laughs> Bye, Queens! <laughs> <laughs> Like Kissinger, he'd been drafted into the U.S. Army, and like Kissinger, he earned his U.S. citizenship while serving. When Kramer discovered that Kissinger also spoke fluent German, he took Kissinger under his wing and ensured his assignment to the 84th Infantry Division's military intelligence. Together, they fought in the Battle of the Bulge and participated in the liberation of mm. a German concentration camp. Kissinger wrote of the liberation of the Hanover Alum concentration camp, I had never seen people degraded to the level that people were in Alum. They barely looked human. They were skeletons. Now, you would think that that would make you like... And he's like, and I hope I get to see it again. <laughs> I, I hope I get to do that to someone one day. <laughs> okay, so now I know how it feels. Yeah. But, like, sometimes you got to walk a mile in somebody else's genocidal shoes. <laughs> Kissinger eventually joined the Counterintelligence Corps. Kissinger was assigned <laughs> to the 979th CIC Detachment, which was a part of the Army Counterintelligence Corps under orders to collect information on and recruit ex-Nazis for U.S. anti-Soviet intelligence operations. Fuck yeah! Yes, I think if there's anyone that you can trust to work for you and, and give you covert intelligence it's a nazi i've always mm -hmm. said that yeah america rocks i love that they're like <laughs> hey nazis remember those guys that we like allied against you with what if you came over to our side and we <laughs> did a little fuckery to them i also love the phrase counterintelligence because i know intelligence also refers to like literal data but just the idea of naming yourselves the like we're the opposite of smart. <laughs> the dumb dumb. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> oh my god, we Don't are worry. counterintelligence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's that's our second podcast name where we talk about leftist <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we just talk about dumb takes on Twitter. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, no. Save this. Write this down and text it to me once you're editing. Babe, we're, we're recording it right now. All right. While working for the CIC, he was placed in command of denazification efforts in the Bergstrasse region of Hess, which essentially gave him absolute authority over the law in the region. Okay. And having this taste of unbridled power at the age of 22 didn't affect him at all. And he only ever did good things. The end. Oh, my God. OK, I honestly thought this was going to be a little worse, but <laughs> um, I'm so glad he's dead because... He sounded, I don't know, a little annoying. Like a little, a little full of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I have some more notes here. Okay. At Kramer's suggestion, Kissinger left City College of New York and went to Harvard, graduating with his bachelor's in political science in 1950 and achieving his master's and doctorate in 1951 and 1954, respectively. I got to say, like, all the most sinister things come out of Ivy League colleges, and I think mm -hmm. that they should be abolished. Stanford. I've always said, don't trust anyone with a doctorate. So true. Yeah. That's why when I have my surgery done, I just ask the guy in the alleyway outside Kaiser Permanente. Is that a real place? Yeah, it's a hospital. I knew that. It sounded really real. <laughs> <laughs> Kissinger started his undergrad at Harvard in 1947, but he kept his ties to the military intelligence community so that by the time he started his graduate program in 1950, he was also working part time as a consultant for the Defense Department. Like he's multitasking. He he does have a grind set. Yeah, I bet. I bet his color blocking and his planner was so cute. Oh, my God. I bet he was a menace with Google Calendar. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do we know his, his star sign? Oh, shit. I didn't look it up. No. Okay. We'll look it up for the for the morgue. Okay. In 1952, write that down. In 1952, while still a grad student, he was a consultant to the National Security Council's Psychological Strategy Board, which ran covert psychological and paramilitary operations, otherwise known as PSYOPs. Ooh. I've heard about those on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Kissinger, like, definitely had, like sock puppet accounts on twitter like before he died like <laughs> i've definitely been told that i'm a psyop so i'm assuming <laughs> it means like cute kind of annoying like grows mm. on you so true so true yeah. after completing his doctorate at harvard he stays on as a harvard facility member and teaches lectures in political science but he still also works as a consultant for the u.s government he loves consulting he loves consulting he loves he has such telling big you ideas. what he thinks And in 1955, he was made a consultant to the NSC's Operating Coordinating Board, which was, according to Seymour M. Hirsch in The Price of Power, the NSC's highest policymaking board for implementing clandestine operations against foreign governments. Like, this was the era that we were, like, really fucking around in, in places like Guatemala and stuff and, like, just, like, overthrowing their governments. Why? Did they have something that you wanted? Because they elected some leaders that we didn't like. So, like, we would overthrow their governments and their democratically elected leaders. Uh, Yeah. And we'd, like, install our own. Oh. So he, fresh out of teaching at Harvard for a couple of years, you know, like, still in his mid-20s, early 30s, is, like, working for them. In 1957, he publishes Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, in which he, ad- it's a book, in which he advocates <laughs> for the tactical, regular use of nuclear weapons in order to win wars. <laughs> um, who... Hmm. Question about the target demo. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I would love to see the book proposal for this. It was, I mean, it was for Americans. (laughs) Oh, okay. Now that makes sense. Now now that I'm thinking about it, I can tell that that's right. It was wildly popular. It was (laughs) critical of the Eisenhower administration's massive retaliation response, which was basically like, if the Soviet Union, Union does anything, we'll just hit back with anything and everything we have, like nuclear and otherwise. And Kissinger was like, what if instead of that, we just constantly, we we attacked first, like the best mm-hmm. defense is good offense. Yes. Uh, and we just constantly hit them with with nuclear weapons. Until they're all gone. Yeah. Or until... I mean... I mean... That works. If, you're in, if your goal is genocide... <laughs> And again, kind of like about his because like Kissinger's like political philosophy and like mindset and outlook is like so interesting because he's a psychopath. And Greg Grandin writes, Kissinger is inevitably called a realist, which is true if realism is defined as holding a pessimistic view of human nature and a belief that power is needed to impose order on an anarchic social <laughs> relations. Like, what because book is that's, this from? Was that the price of power? Kissinger's shadow. Okay, they're both a little cunty. <laughs> they're, they're super cunty. <laughs> they do not love him. They're us. <laughs> they're literally us. And it's so true. Like, it's like so true, Bastie. That's so such true. a good quote, though. <laughs> like, th- like liberals love to be like, he's he's just a realist. And it's like, yeah, if you think that like if you think that every other country is constantly going to be like every other person on this earth is constantly going to be attacking us unless you're, you're constantly (laughs) like quashing them. And this would lead to everyone else on the planet constantly attacking you. If you just started dropping nukes all over the place, like people are going to be like, Hey, (laughs) put a pin in that. (laughs) Oh God. Okay. Nuclear weapons and foreign policy makes Kissinger into a U.S. foreign policy celebrity. Like, everyone in Ew. politics and in the media are like, this guy fucking rocks. Not the foreign policy slebs. Yeah. He's a... That's... What a what a sick celeb. Can you imagine, like, <laughs> standing someone for foreign policy? <laughs> the fucking globe emoji energy. <laughs> like, Honestly, sick. that... I could not imagine trusting someone 
who not only has opinions on foreign policy, has like foreign policy, like, like icons, like, Ew. like get away from me. <laughs> so he starts wanting to have like a more central role in politics and have more influence on U.S. foreign, like have actual influence on U.S. foreign policy. So through some of his connections within the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, Kissinger managed to connect himself with Nelson Rockefeller and serve as his presidential campaign foreign policy advisor, supporting his bids for the Republican nomination in 1960, 1964, and 1968. During this period, among a few other things that were going on, the United States was involving itself in a little conflict called the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Heard of her. So in the broadest possible terms because we're glossing over everything in this, the Vietnam War was a civil war that was being waged as a proxy war between the communist and anti-communist nations during the Cold War, with the Soviet Union and China supporting North Vietnam and the U.S. providing aid and eventually American military support to South Vietnam. The U.S.'s involvement in Vietnam certainly escalated under the Kennedy administration starting in 1961, but East Asia wasn't really Kennedy's focus. But on... November 22nd, 1963, the CIA assassinated JFK for refusing to go to patreon.com slash respect the dead and become one of our patrons. And it could happen to you too if you don't immediately go to http colon slash slash patreon.com slash respect the dead and sign up today. I'm on the grassy canal right now with a gun <laughs> if you don't sign the fuck up. <laughs> Does that constitute a legal threat? Are we going to get into trouble for that? <laughs> Spotify is not going to allow ads to play on this one. <laughs> Yay. More of a reason to go sign up for our motherfucking Patreon. Sign up or you'll get canoled. Kennedy's VP, Lyndon Big Dick Johnson, is immediately mm -hmm. sworn into office. And under his administration, U.S. involvement in the conflict becomes a major focus. So as the foreign policy advisor for a hopeful Republican challenger to the incumbent Johnson administration, Kissinger decides to do a little, little boots on the ground research in Vietnam. Oh, my God. Kissin a little yeah. Carmen San Diegoing. He's going he's going full Carol Marinera. He's okay. Like, I'm okay. gonna go see what this is about and I'm gonna report back. Kissinger's first visit to South Vietnam was in October 1965. Upon returning home, he privately remarked to Cyrus Vance and Avril Harriman, President Johnson's top officials, that we couldn't win. Immediately in 1965, he visits once and he's like, This is a losing war. Like, there's no way we're gonna win. But publicly, he threw his support behind the war. <laughs> now, as I said before, Kissinger was working for the Nelson Rockefeller campaign in the hopes of being offered a job in the Rockefeller administration if Rockefeller was elected. Rockefeller would eventually serve as vice president under Gerald Ford, but all three of his campaigns for the presidency would result in his getting primaried. In 1964, he was primaried by Barry Goldwater, a staunch conservative so right wing that many members of his own party were reluctant to endorse him. And both in 1960 and 1968, Rockefeller was primaried by a little guy you might have heard of called Richard Milhouse Nixon. Milhouse. Milhouse. <laughs> no. Is this trickly dickly? And this is our tricky dick. <laughs> this is our slippy dick. <laughs> Not our slippery dick by peaches. Our sweet boy. I love him Ugh. so much. Most evil president, and it's not even fucking close. In 1960, Nixon got beat in the general election by the much sexier JFK. And in 1964, mm -hmm. the incumbent Johnson fucking curb stomps Barry Waters' ass. Like, it is an embarrassing landslide victory but by the 1968 election the republicans stand a pretty decent chance at winning against the democratic front runner lbj's vice president hubert humphrey it's a fucking stupid name hubert humphrey hubert humphrey sounds like somebody from a dr seuss book if you don't if you want to win the presidency first of all don't be named hubert humphrey I would never, I would simply never vote for somebody named Hubert the same way that I wouldn't vote for like a worm or like a, yeah. a, 
a slightly cracked snail. Would you still love me if I was a worm, though? Would you still do a podcast with me if I were a worm? Can you talk? Well, I, I guess if we're doing a podcast, probably. Well, yeah, I would make worm. millions. Oh my god, it'd be so cute. We'd have <laughs> to move talking my mic worms. Down. <laughs> I, I wouldn't just do the podcast with you. I would fly there, put you in a cage, and then sell you for mi- oh not God. like literally sell you, but like Shot I would me get around. a conservative ship. Mm. You would be <laughs> performing ship. like you you would be performing <laughs> nightly. <laughs> oh my God, my little worm, my little worm vaudeville show. He's so cute, <laughs> so <I> adorable. <laughs> <laughs> I wiggle around in cute costumes. A little reality show. <laughs> I would definitely 3D print you a like gorgeous tiny little house. Oh my like, god. It would oh, be like I would what's make it called? Sylvanus. Like, oh, Sylvanian drama. Yeah. Yeah. We would beat them so easily at the social marketing social yeah. media. Social media marketing. I thing. mean, they don't have a talking worm. They just no. have little and they never will. critters. Yeah, they don't even talk. So So other than being named Hubert Humphrey, Humphrey's unpopularity was in no small part because of the Vietnam War. It was at that point very unpopular with the American people. And while it didn't start under Johnson's administration, it had become it had come to be viewed as Johnson's war. In the summer of 1968, Nixon recruited a staunch anti-communist named Richard V. Allen to his campaign staff. Allen was frequently referred to as Dr. Allen in the press, despite the fact that he had never completed his doctorate program in political (laughs) science at the University of Munich. It's giving Dr. Phil. Yeah. Or Dr. Fauci. (laughs) Right. Sorry, I just like I just like name dropping (laughs) random American people that the right wing people are mad at. I have no (laughs) idea like who he is other than something to do with COVID. Despite this stolen PhD valor, Mm -hmm. Allen recognized that he didn't have the expertise or experience to work as Nixon's national security advisor. So should Nixon ascend to the presidency, he recommended someone else for the job. A Harvard professor of government who had also served as a foreign policy advisor on (laughs) Nelson A. Rockefeller's campaign earlier that year, our boy Henry Kissinger. Kissinger told Allen that he wouldn't formally join the campaign. Quote, I can do you more good by not coming out for you publicly. (laughs) (laughs) He said, I'm a little toxic and so are you. (laughs) Like, we don't want to be seen together. It's like dating a closeted guy. Yeah. So he served the campaign in secret. He served for that campaign. Sorry, I'm going to spend this entire thing making him a gay icon until, which is what I do every episode, uh, until we get to the Mm -hmm. genocide. And then I'm going to be like, oof, gay people are terrible. Oh, no. Allen would describe himself in an interview with Seymour M. Hirsch for The Price of Power as becoming a handmaiden of Henry Kissinger's drive for power. <laughs> <laughs> Not him using turf lingo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a little cute because I'm picturing like the little like the little wings. Yes. More men should wear bonnets. I legitimately agree. Both like like an out, like a good Amishy outdoorsy bonnet, but also like a sleeping bonnet. Yeah, it's good for your curls. In August of 1968, the Republican National Convention selected Richard Nixon as its nominee for the general election. In the second half of 1968, delegates from the United States and North Vietnam secretly met weekly in Paris to begin negotiating a potential route out of the war. And Kissinger knew this and fed information to the Nixon campaign. From The Price of Power, quote, What Allen and the Nixon entourage could not know was the extent of Kissinger's maneuvering. In funneling information from Paris to the Nixon campaign, he would not only be taking advantage of professional friendships, but also betraying people with whom he had worked on the still-secret Vietnam negotiating efforts. At the same time, he would continue telling colleagues at Harvard and friends in Cambridge, Martha's Vineyard, and New York about his contempt for Nixon and his anger at Rockefeller's defeat in Miami Beach. He's a snake. He is a snake. He's he's a snake. He's a like, he's a little bitch. Like he's two faced. It's one thing to be a bad person. It's another thing to be like a pro, like 
to be a bad person but also to betray everyone like on your own side too i guess all right-wing yeah. people are like that like kissinger also doesn't actually believe in anything like there are there are right wing people who like bomb. firmly believe things yeah he believes in bombs but he doesn't have like <laughs> any <laughs> he doesn't have an ideology yeah. there are right wing people that have ideologies that firmly believe like yeah. even anti communism like he is anti communist because he thinks that's like the winning the winning yeah. team but like he he doesn't actually have any strong feelings about communism and that's why it's so easy for him to like betray his political allies and the like to stab them in the back because he doesn't actually care or believe in anything he just wants to win he just wants he's just a social climber and winners are just losers <laughs> Who wins? So true. Winners are just losing. <laughs> Not you quoting a Daily Wire movie in my Henry Kissinger episode. <laughs> a few weeks after the Republican convention, in a letter to a fellow political scientist at the University of Denver, Kissinger described Nixon's behavior after his nomination in Miami Beach as astoundingly ungenerous, petty, and I should have thought against his long-term interests. He made similar <laughs> comments about Nixon throughout the fall. What did you think? I thought you were going to say, I should have thought of it first. <laughs> like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and I like should have thought of it first. No. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't that self-aware. He made similar comments about Nixon throughout the fall, repeatedly expressing concern for the fate of the nation if Nixon... If Nix if Nixon were to be elected, he also offered, <laughs> he was also offering to give dirt on Nixon to the Humphrey campaign during this time. Again, <laughs> He's such a messy shit. bitch. He's, He's so giving messy. George Santos. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like if, <laughs> if Henry Kissinger were gay, he would have been much more iconic. Like I'd be happier about this. <laughs> Nixon initially does better than Humphrey in the polls, but as October draws near, the gap was narrowing. On September 17th, Kissinger contacted Ambassador Avril Harriman and pretended that he had broken with the Republicans, writing to him that they were unfit to govern. So he... It, uh, <laughs> ambassador Harriman is the ambassador that's working on the negotiations between North Vietnam and the United States to to try to bring them to the table with South Vietnam. Okay. And so he's like writing to him and being like, I'm a Democrat now. <laughs> he then visited Harriman in Paris and inquired after the peace talks. <laughs> he's like, so how's it going? How are the peace talks coming along? Um, can I just say I love a good Harriman? Like, Me what too. a gorgeous name. In late September and early October, Kissinger lets the Nixon campaign know that something is up with the Paris talks and that the Johnson administration might be closing in on an end to the war, which would be potentially disastrous to the Nixon campaign. Kissinger advises the Nixon campaign to, quote, put the Vietnam monkey on Humphrey's back, not Johnson's, and to imply that the Humphrey campaign was playing politics with the war. So Nixon even starts calling for bombing pauses and peace at political rallies and ran his campaign on claiming to have a secret plan to end the war. Then on October 9th at the Paris meetings, the North Vietnamese delegates asked Ambassador Avril Harriman if the U.S. would stop bombing if the Hanoi government agreed to come to the table with representatives from South Vietnam. And the Johnson administration immediately began negotiating, negotiating with the Saigon government to try and make this happen. It would be the beginning of real peace talks. So this is like the, com the communist government is like, if you guys agree to stop bombing, we will, we will sit down and talk with South Vietnam. So cooperative. Yeah. By late October, the latest election polls showed Humphrey two points behind Nixon. The election was going to be very close. Kissinger wrote a letter to Humphrey criticizing Nixon and asking to be part of the Humphrey administration. <laughs> <laughs> Humphrey's aide, Ted Van Dyke, said of the letter, it was so grotesque. Mm -hmm. I wasn't angry at him. I remember Henry being a both sides of the street kind of guy. Bye. On October 22nd, 1968, Nixon called his aide, H.R. Haldeman, and told him to monkey wrench the Paris peace talks. 
The South Vietnamese. Why do they keep saying monkey like this? Like throw a monkey on his back, monkey wrench this. Like They love the word monkey. They're obsessed. The South Vietnamese president, Nguyen Van Chu, was afraid that LBJ's administration was preparing to sell them out. And Nixon knew that he could play into those fears to stall the peace talks. Nixon used Anna Cheno, a pro-nationalist China lobbyist and Nixon fundraiser with connections in several anti-communist movements and governments in Asia to intercede on his behalf. They convinced Tu to reject the Johnson administration's peace deals and to turn down any requests to come to the table, promising him that if elected, Nixon would give him a better deal. Two days before the Paris peace talks, Tu withdrew from the agreement. Johnson had been aware of Nixon's meddling and said, this is treason. It would rock the world. And it was treason. This, this is why, this is why like hating on Kissinger and Nixon should be a bipartisan issue. Yeah, it's very, it should be an American issue. Yes. Like, because he, he sabotaged peace talks in order to win an election. The idea that like that's what a realist would do and not somebody who is like so self-centered and like Mm -hmm. and self-important like it's more important that like we win Mm -hmm. than people live is like that's not (laughs) that's not like utility not that's not utilitarian either (laughs) like no (laughs) It's just (laughs) (laughs) self-serving. The first, the first chapter of Hirsch's book, The Price of Power, is called The Job Seeker, which is very cunty. Very cunty. Richard Nixon would win the election. Henry Kissinger would be made his national security advisor. And the Vietnam War would stretch on for another seven brutal years, ending with Hanoi's victory in 1975. This directly led to the deaths of tens of thousands more American troops. And in the low estimates, hundreds of thousands, but possibly in the low millions of like of people in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. That's sick. So let's let's take an ad break. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i need to go for a fucking walk <laughs> brought to you by our sponsor the vietnam war <laughs> brought to you by our sponsor the hanoi government <laughs> and we're back in grad school kissinger had earned himself the nickname henry ass kissinger and now his ass kissing Got him. Had earned- <laughs> and now his ass kissing had scored him a job in the nixon white house they got him so fucking good <laughs> from Kissinger's shadow. After Nixon's victory, Kissinger did what he could to keep Nixon's attention, including starting the false rumor that the outgoing Johnson administration planned to either depose or assassinate the president of South Vietnam, Nguyen Van Tu, before leaving office. Once in the White House, Nixon and Kissinger had no fucking idea how they were actually going to end the war, a thing that Nixon had been promising in his campaign trail. They settled on the madman theory which was basically like, we'll make it out like Nixon is like so crazy and so bloodthirsty that he'll try anything, like he'll do anything. Okay. Uh, and then and then North Vietnam will like wave their little white flag. Right. It's like if uh, people give like really bad advice about this, but they'll be like, if somebody were to attack me, I would just act crazier than they are. Yeah. That kind of vibe. There, okay. There were like, people. We'll do anything. We don't care. Yeah. I mean, there were people that were like trying to argue that on Trump's behalf, like the the soft MAGA people who recognized that Trump was like fucking insane, but like wanted to (laughs) play that into their favor. They were like, well, it's probably good for foreign policy because he seems like, you know, so unhinged that like uh, our rivals aren't going to try to mess with him. Like this was like an actual theory that Nixon and Kissinger came up with together. Okay. So in February of 1969, weeks after taking office and lasting through April of 1970, U.S. warplanes secretly dropped 110,000 tons of bombs on Cambodia. (gasps) What do you mean secretly? Cambodia was a neutral country, which meant that bombing Cambodia violated the United Nations Charter. But it was Mm -hmm. also through Cambodia and neighboring Laos that Viet Cong 
moved between North and South Vietnam utilizing the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In Kissinger's Shadow, Greg Grandin describes the process of carrying out the secret bombing. The B-52 would be diverted from its cover target in South Vietnam into Cambodia, where it would drop its bomb load on the real target. When the run was complete, the officer in charge of the deception would burn whatever documents, maps, computer printouts, radar reports, messages, and so on that might reveal the actual flight. Then he would write up false post-strike paperwork, indicating that the South Vietnam sortie was flown as planned. This way, Congress and Pentagon administrators would be provided phony target coordinates and other forged data so as to account for actual expenditures of fuel, bombs, and spare parts without ever having to reveal that Cambodia was being bombed. So, like, what wasn't Cambodia like, hey, you're bombing us? Yes. I guess nobody could, like, tweet about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, at this point, like, if the American news isn't reporting on it mm-hmm. as, like, some... Who knows? Then the, yeah, fuck, okay. Yeah. Hirsch's The Price of Power quotes a Cambodian radio broadcast. So there was radio <laughs> from March 26th <laughs> to 1969. Quote... The Cambodian population living in the border regions has been bombed almost daily by U.S. aircraft, and the number of people killed as well as material destruction continues to grow. They have made many attacks in recent weeks, causing losses to the Cambodian people. The list of victims is getting longer and longer. The aggressors made another murderous attack on the night of 23rd of March. A plane coming from South Vietnam strafed one of the border villages located about 1,500 meters inside our territory. This is quite a serious attack. Three children were killed and nine Cambodians were wounded, six of them seriously. This attack is another inhuman and unjustified attack because the area is densely populated and is not a staging area for the Viet Minh or Viet Cong. The Viet Minh or Viet Cong, as we know, are located in remote and sparsely inhabited areas. However, U.S. airplanes have never attacked them. The Americans and the South Vietnamese prefer to attack the areas inhabited by peaceful Cambodian farmers in order to demoralize the latter. The secret bombing campaign was codenamed Operation Menu, and it served to push North yeah. Vietnamese insurgents deeper. Yeah. And like all within Operation Don't Menu, be they, had like, about it. they had lots of jokey code names like breakfast and lunch. No. Yeah. It's fucking sick. Give, we're like giving them their breakfast, and it's like mm. bombs. Bombs. Sick. And it served to push North Vietnamese insurgents deeper into Cambodia and destabilize the country, which basically manufactured consent for an overt invasion and bombing campaign known as Operation Freedom Deal. In April 1970, following an American-led coup that overthrew Cambodia's Prince Sihanouk, Nixon ordered U.S. troops in Vietnam to invade Cambodia outright. From Prince Sihanouk of Cambodia's memoirs, quote, It was from American bombs and shells that our peasants suffered in the frontier border areas, not from the occasional presence of the Viet Cong. And in the areas most frequently and most heavily bombed, there had never been any trace of the Viet Cong. The corpses found were those of Cambodian peasants, including a high proportion of women and children. In total, more ordnance would be dropped on Cambodia during the Vietnam War than the Allies dropped in the entirety of World War II. This is a country about the size of Missouri. I like, until recently, I never really could picture this. Picture like what something like this would look like. Uh, But from what everything I've seen on Twitter in the last like two, three months, um, being able to picture it makes it like, so much more devastating to think of like that's it's interesting it's that you bring that up because like vietnam also marked a really big turning point in the way we fought wars because like um there was so so much more like news footage than mm-hmm. there had ever been like there was news footage from once the people can see what you're War. doing yeah and that's part of what made it so unpopular and now we have phones and I, I think public opinion of of these 
wars has turned in part because we can see what they look like. Yeah. Well, because people don't really believe it if they can't. Mm -hmm. If they can't Picture see it, if they don't see children actually being. Well, yeah, it's it's children, occasionally women, but seeing that there's like not that much difference between like a, a, a neighborhood, like a couple blocks from you, like it, it takes a lot of people like they have to be able to say, but what if that was me? But it's very difficult to do that for like uh people you've first you can't even like yeah just this many people dead and it's like that's just a number but actually seeing the like rubble seeing like the crying children like that mm -hmm. i think makes it a lot more real and this makes sense to me like in terms of like uh american anti-war efforts and like um the like movements that that sprang up like and the rise in them, that makes sense to me now more than it did before. Yeah. Kissinger relaying Nixon's orders was said to issue a command to U.S. forces. Anything that flies on anything that moves. <sighs> a secret bombing campaign had been conducted in the country of Laos since before the Nixon administration, but under Nixon and Kissinger, bombing of the tiny landlocked nation intensified. And they are part of the reason today... Laos is the most bombed country in the history of the world. From Kissinger's shadow, Kissinger helped transform Nixon's madman policy from performance, an act meant to convey insanity, to an actual act of moral inanity. The ravaging of two neutral countries, according to one study, the United States dropped 790,000 cluster bombs on those two countries, as well as on Vietnam, releasing just under a trillion pieces of shrapnel, either ball bearings or razor sharp barbed darts. More bombs were dropped separately on Cambodia and Laos than combined on Japan and Germany during World War II. For Cambodia, Ben Kiernan and Taylor Owen provide a definitive tally. They write that it remains undisputed that in 1969 to 1973 alone, around 500,000 tons of U.S. bombs fell on Cambodia. Moreover, this figure excludes the additional bomb tonnage dropped on Cambodia by the U.S.-backed Air Force of the Republic of Vietnam, which also flew numerous bombing missions there in 1970 and 1971. The amount of bombs that hit Laos is even more stunning. U.S. pilots flew on average one sortie every eight minutes and dropped a ton of explosives for every a ton of explosives for every Laotian, delivering a total of 2.5 million tons in nearly 600,000 runs. Laos, says the Voice of America, is the most heavily bombed country in history. That's such a fucked up statistic to have. Like, most heavily bombed country. Like, that is a like... A ton of... A ton of bombs for every single person. It took me a second when you said a ton because I was like, oh my God. Not like she a lot. She means like an actual unit like an of actual fucking ton. measurement here. That's in. It's like it unfathomable. Beyond for overkill. Me. Like. Yeah. The fact, the fact that there are even still any people in Laos and Cambodia. Well, yeah, that's, is that like, is like. That is an incredibly violent massacre of like, like of, of such, two like, neutral countries. Yeah. But like of, of like a proportion, like I look outside and I try and like to picture that. And it's just, if it's anybody ever attempted to do anything like this to the United States, like the world would end like, like we would nuke the entire world <sighs> today in vietnam laos and cambodia government-run agencies and charities still work to remove unexploded ordnance and landmines left over from a war that ended half a century ago hundreds of people are killed and many more are injured in laos and cambodia each year as hidden bombs detonate decades after they were, were released <sighs> 40% oh of the victims are children. I never thought about the ones that like didn't trigger and just 
are still there. We're just laying there. There's actually Jesus there's Christ. amazing there's amazing teams of like trained rats that are trained oh my God. to yeah. like go sniff out um, landmines because they're so small that they don't like set them off. You can ask Sidekick if he's okay with this being put in there, but apparently he's sponsoring one of those rats. Oh, <laughs> I, love I told it. him I was I was sponsoring my my Shark Tank, and he was like, "I have a rat that finds bombs." <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> In the years since, Kissinger tried to downplay his illegal bombing of Cambodia and Laos by claiming that Barack Obama's drone strikes in the Middle East are responsible for more dead civilians. Is that true? Uh, maybe. Okay. Who who cares? I was just uh, like Obama. the most bombed country. I'm like, uh, they can actually Is that true? both be bad. <laughs> they can both be bad. Well, I mean, <laughs> just first question: Is that true? <laughs> Second, Second question, question, why should I care? Why does it matter? <laughs> yeah. Like Obama's bombing campaigns in Somalia, Syria, and Yemen were a direct result of Kissinger's normalization of bombing neutral countries. Like that yeah. Kissinger made that a thing, and now that is a thing. That is it's that like is just very what much the US like does. I learned it from you, Dad. Yeah. Basically, Kissinger was just the first person to be like, would anybody stop the U.S. if they did this? Yeah. And the answer okay, was no. So every person what if we? <laughs> what if we just did it? Yeah. Like, what if we just did it? What if, I always say, like, instead of asking for permission, do it anyways and never apologize. That's um, right. And blame someone else. <laughs> While Kissinger was ordering everything that flies on everything that moves, he was consolidating power within the National Security Council by completely restructuring it and placing the organization, and by extension himself, in charge of foreign policy decisions. Of course. He also, he also consolidated power through the unique relationship he cultivated with the press. From Hirsch's The Price of Power... David R. Halperin, a young Navy officer recruited from the Pentagon in late 1970 to serve as Kissinger's personal aide, recalls that Kissinger spent as much as half of each working day in meetings or in telephone conversations with reporters, far more than he seemed to spend reading NSC staff memoranda. The price of such systematic access to Kissinger was deference, and it was a price willingly paid by the journalists who were unable to meet regularly or casually with Haldeman, Ehrlichman, or other top aides. The route resembled an implicit shakedown scheme in which reporters who got inside information in turn protected Kissinger by not divulging either the full consequences of his acts or his own connection to them. Hirsch relates another anecdote illustrating what happened when a journalist published an unflattering article about Kissinger. Stuart Lurie, White House correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, published a sharply critical article. He noted, prematurely as it turned out, that the patina is beginning to wear off the Kissinger mystique. Lurie raised questions about Vietnam and said that Kissinger has lost the respect of many of his old friends and associates on the nation's campuses. The response was melodramatic. David J. Craslow, the Los Angeles Times news editor in Washington, was abruptly summoned to Kissinger's office. As Craslow walked into the office, Lori says, Henry jumped up from behind his desk, rushed at him and said, I don't care who you send to cover the White House, but I don't ever want to see Lori again. It took months and the intervention of Robert Donovan, the distinguished journalist who was the Washington bureau chief for the Times before Kissinger would talk to Lori again. Lori left the White House beat the following spring. He's so sensitive. Yeah. He sounds triggered there. <laughs> um, trigger grandpa. <laughs> I'm assuming he was born 100. He kind of looked at it. I'll, I'll <laughs> be sending a picture near the end of the episode. Okay. Kissinger could apparently be like very charming and uh, he liked being surrounded by fawning journalists and elites. And when you were on his good side, he had a way of like revealing just enough information to make a journalist mm. feel like they were an insider. But he also yeah. tightly controlled who had access to the White House beat. Haldeman once said of Kissinger, we knew Henry as the hawk of hawks in the Oval Office, Bob Haldeman wrote. But in the evenings, a magical transformation took place. Touching glasses at a party with his liberal friends, the belligerent Kissinger would suddenly become a dove. 
David Keene, who was the chief of staff for Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, said of Kissinger, Kissinger had one line for liberals, one for conservatives, and all the time he'd swear you to secrecy. What I'm about to tell you is the highest classified information. And he'd give you some bullshit and he'd give somebody else the opposite. Okay, that's funny. <laughs> that is funny. I do love to spread misinformation. <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> it is. Like just like playing a bunch of people. Like he was he was it's a little party game. Just invite <laughs> everybody to your party and be like oh my god i can't believe she said that about you i honestly like what everybody is saying i don't think it's true like i think you're actually like quite charming and your teeth are not that fucked up <laughs> kissinger also wiretapped the fuck out of everyone just like his boss richard nixon <laughs> okay you know what harriet the spy did it and it was fine yeah so like they loved some wiretapping. A boy can't have a hobby. To quote the aforementioned Rolling Stone article, Kissinger used the fear of internal leaks to get the FBI to wiretap his staff and the journalists he suspected of receiving their information. In <laughs> fact, he often even wiretapped Nixon when Nixon wasn't wiretapping himself. <laughs> so Kissinger and Nixon's relationship was like very interesting. Kissinger would often shit talk about Nixon behind his back, mocking the fact yeah. that his boss was usually drunk off his at like Kalen, Richard Nixon, who is definitely going to be an episode one day, was so drunk all the time. Like Rob Every Ford, day like he was an like office. fucked yes. up. Oh my okay. god, they would have a Rob Ford Nixon <laughs> party would have like gone hard. There'd be bodies. So wild. <laughs> so Kissinger would often like mock Nixon behind his back for being drunk off his ass, and ranted to his NSC colleagues that if the president had his way, there would be a nuclear war every week. <laughs> didn't he write like an entire book about how much he loves nuclear war i know he was like, like he was like we should do nuclear war every week and then he's like if this bitch had his way we do nuclear war every week <laughs> like why are you such a fraud but also so like bad at it <laughs> like <laughs> Nixon was an alcoholic, racist idiot, and when he'd get drunk and start going on bigoted tirades on the phone to Kissinger, Kissinger would call his NSC colleagues over to listen on the line. <laughs> <He'd be> like, <laughs> <laughs> like three-waying a friend and like not telling them. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and being like, what do you think of April? <laughs> Tell me the truth of what you, th you thought about Nixon's outfit today. <laughs> But when Kissinger was in Nixon's presence, Ask Kissinger would come back out. Mm -hmm. An article about the relationship between the two men in Politico magazine quotes a former White House aide as saying, Nixon would make an outrageous statement. And instead of humming and staring at the ceiling like I do, Kissinger would eagerly rumble in with, yes, Mr. President, your analysis is absolutely correct and certainly very profound. <laughs> <laughs> He's like an Elon reply guy. The article goes on to explain how Nixon toyed with Kissinger. For his part, Nixon seemed to enjoy unnerving his national security advisor. Nixon <laughs> would talk about Jewish traitors, recalled Ehrlichman, Ooh. and he'd play off Kissinger. Isn't that right, Henry? Don't you agree? And Henry <laughs> and Henry would respond. <laughs> and Henry would respond, Well, Mr. President, there are Jews, and then there are Jews. <gasps> Once? <laughs> yeah. Once, when Nixon phoned with a particularly crude rant, a top NSC aide asked, why didn't you say something? Quote, I have enough trouble fighting with him on the things that really matter, Kissinger sighed. His yep. attitudes towards Jews and blacks are not my worry. <sighs> this man, in like every way, is a disappointment. <laughs> yeah. Like... Like, there's not, like, a single thing you've told me about the way that he turned out that isn't just, like, extremely disappointing knowing his yeah. history. Like, it's it would be one thing if he grew up, like, incredibly, like, super priv, like, not a care in the world, like, suckling on that silver spoon. But, like, his his story is, like, a first hand, like first hand witness, his story is witnessing first hand, like the 
like atrocities, but then also like the anti-Semitism and the racism. And then he's still like, you know what? Like, yeah, it was like bad, but like, that's not my job to worry about. that. (laughs) But like, that was bad to me. But like, if I don't care about who it's bad to, then is it maybe good? (laughs) There's like, there's another famous quote. um, And I'm going to paraphrase here because it's not in my script where he says something like, um, if I hadn't been born Jewish, I might've been (gasps) anti-Semitic. Like he was one of those, one of those guys who was like, well, if the Jews didn't want to get killed, why did they line up to get slaughtered? He was one of those. (laughs) Then why were they Jewish? (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Kissinger's big claim to fame. The reason so many liberals are (laughs) willing to overlook his war crimes is that he helped the U S and China reach a detente. Okay. So we do not have the time and I don't have the energy to get into all the specifics of this particular moment in geopolitics, but I wouldn't understand them anyway. And you know that. So you're, (laughs) I know this is, this is for me, you know, (laughs) this is just for you. (laughs) It's so weird how we record all of our conversations like this. It's very Nixon and Kissinger of us. I wasn't aware that you knew. (laughs) I thought I was wiretapping you like besties do. Oh my God. I thought I was wiretapping you. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god <laughs> we're so funny and like unethical in like a cute way yeah we're we're serving nixinger <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like like a uber slur <laughs> <laughs> i think it is i think i'm gonna get canceled for using the i was about to call it the end slur but nope, nope. it's not that nope 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 <laughs> Mm-mm-mm. The other N word. <laughs> In this period of the Cold War, tensions had built up and communication had broken down between the USSR and China. And obviously, like both countries had always had an intense rivalry with the US since the end of the Second World War. Mm, obviously. So shit is like very scary right now. Like you have three nuclear powers that like aren't mm-hmm. getting along and aren't talking to each other. But The breakdown in communications between China and the USSR also starts to present the U.S. with something of an opportunity to step in and start negotiating with China about opening up diplomatic and economic relations between the two countries. One of the men who would be vital to establishing the backdoor communications between the Nixon White House and China was a man named Yahya Khan. Yahya Khan was the military dictator of West Pakistan, which is now what is known as Pakistan. And in 1971, he waged a campaign of genocide against the people of East Pakistan, what is now Bangladesh. The U.S. Consul General in East Pakistan, Archer K. Blood, sent Kissinger and Nixon a telegram informing them of what he described as a selective genocide of Bengali intelligentsia, Hindus, and East Pakistan independent supporters. Nixon quoted Kissinger as saying, we can't allow a friend of ours and China's to get screwed in a conflict with a friend of India's. And the telegram was ignored. Blood sent a second telegram that read, our government has failed to denounce the suppression of democracy. Our government has failed to denounce atrocities. Our government has failed to take forceful measures to protect its citizens, while at the same time bending over backwards to placate the West Pakistan-dominated government and to lessen any deservedly negative international public relations impact against them. Our government has evidenced what many will consider moral bankruptcy. But we have chosen not to intervene, even morally, on the grounds that the Awami conflict, in which unfortunately the overworked term genocide is applicable, is purely an internal matter of a sovereign state. Private Americans have expressed disgust. We, as professional civil servants, express our dissent with current policy and fervently hope that our true and lasting interests here can be defined and our policies redirected in order to salvage our nation's position as a moral leader of the free world. For this, Kissinger removed blood from his office. (laughs) 
The U.S. not only chose to allow Khan's forces to carry out their genocide, but secretly supplied them with weapons via Iran, Turkey, and Jordan as Pakistan was viewed as a rampart against communism in the region, as India at the time was a bit like socialisty, like kind of socialist adjacent. And they had a female president, Indira Gandhi, who both Nixon and Kissinger described as a bitch. <sighs> With U.S. aid, Yahya Khan's military junta would rape and murder conservatively around 300,000 people, but by some estimates, as many as 3 million. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. So we're we're literally like in Hitler numbers, like not not to evoke Hitler against a German Jewish man, but like between Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia and East Pakistan, we're, we're in the mid millions. This is like, again, like, I, I, I don't like, I don't, not that I don't like saying it's unfathomable, um, because it's like very fathomable to a lot of people, millions and millions of people. Um, but like, I, it's so, the fact that such evil, like, like pure evil is allowed to exist yeah. and like somebody didn't push this man in front of a car or something like, I'm like, I'm very aware of why everybody was like, just on the edge of our seats waiting for him to die now. But like yeah. somebody could have done something. He went to the grocery store. Didn't he like can him hit him with a can. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think he actually went to grocery stores. Ugh. I think he went, he went to restaurants with journalists every fucking night. And this is like why we need to make, we need to be harassing people in restaurants. Yeah. This is also like, I have to say this is, like, this is why Nixon is, like, the most evil U.S. president, and it's not even fucking close. I think... Did you did you maybe, know that before you read these books? Yes, yeah. Or, like, okay. I've known about a lot of this, but, yeah, like, Andrew Jackson might give Nixon a little bit of a run for his money, but I think the body count is still in Nixon's favor. Yeah. Like, it's... It's unbefucking leaveable. So, uh, we're going to take another break, and then when we come back... I want to talk about Chile. Mm. <laughs> I hate this podcast. Just quickly before we talk about Chile, because we're just hitting the low lights today, uh, there's a lot that we're going to skip. And if there is high demand for more Kissinger episodes, like maybe we'll do a deep dive into like some of the events that we like maybe do some episodes that are deep dives into the events that we've had to gloss over. But I do want to just take a moment to mention Africa. Kissinger and Nixon had a policy of strengthening their political relations with white minority governments in Africa, like Rhodesia and apartheid South Africa. This mostly involved relaxing some of the economic policies that had been enacted against those governments. So, you know, they're like, we just, we want to let the racists know but like, we're not mad at them. <laughs> and do you want to know what Nixon and Kissinger called this policy? Do you want to like make a guess? Do you want to mm. guess what they what they operation named it? Mm. How racist is it? On a scale Just of take like, a, take a guess based on what you know about how they talk in private. I don't want to guess. Anything I say is going to make me <laughs> seem racist. <laughs> like, what's the most racist thing I can think of? <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> they called it the tar baby option. No. <laughs> Sorry, I probably like blew out the mic there. <laughs> no. Yeah. 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 When I, read I would that, never, I, I would never have even went there. Like, I screamed. Like, like literally the ones in my head. I was like, Operation Less Than Us. <laughs> like, <laughs> Operation Undeserving of Humanity. <laughs> I was like, oh, that'll get them. <laughs> like, nope. Just mm -hmm. Operation Slur. 
<laughs> Operation Slur. Yep. Although Operation Faggot sounds fucking amazing. Um, oh my god! I so don't cute. think it. <laughs> I think that's. <laughs> <laughs> is that the title of our podcast <laughs> it's like i love the idea of having a podcast title only one of us can say <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's your podcast call called Ooh. operation f slur <laughs> i wish i could tell you i'm I not allowed to tell, tell you, you. <laughs> unfortunately i'm an ally i'm not allowed to say <laughs> on september 4th 1970 chileans elected their new president a democratic socialist named Salvador Allende. Allende demanded reparation from the U.S. for exploiting its copper resources. By the mid-1960s, Chile's copper industry was 80% controlled by U.S. corporations. So when Allende nationalized the mining assets, Allende informed them that he would deduct estimated excess profit from a compensatory package he was willing to pay the U.S. copper firms. Which I think sounds fair. It's like... I'm that nationalizing seems reasonable these. To me, yeah? yeah, he's like, I'm going to recoup our losses from when you fucking took over our copper industry. I will still be paying you out from our excesses. Like, I think that's totally fair. It's like it's very beyond fair. <laughs> yeah, because he actually didn't need to pay them anything. No, <laughs> like actually go chew copper, bitch. <laughs> yeah, fuck off. But instead, he was like, I know you're losing some money because I'm nationalizing these copper mines, so I'm just going to pay you what I think is fair. Said Kissinger, I don't see why we need to stand idly by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibility of its own people. <laughs> so <laughs> I love democracy, but I do think that if people are doing something that like, I personally think is a little stupid, they shouldn't get to then like maybe we make the decision for them as like the arbiters of what is like ethical and correct so on kissinger's orders the cia tried to january 6th allende <sighs> yep u.s covert operations failed at their attempt to prevent allende from taking office but succeeded in assassinating the chilean commander-in-chief of the armed forces Kissinger ran to Daddy Nixon and cried that Chile shouldn't get to democratically elect a president he doesn't like, noting, quote, the example of a successful elected Marxist government in Chile would certainly have an impact on and even precedent value for other parts of the world, especially in Italy. The imitative spread of similar phenomena elsewhere would in turn significantly, significantly affect the world balance and our own position on it. Dunny, if they get to go communist and take back all of their shit, then other people might take back their shit and then I wouldn't have their shit. <laughs> but I want their shit daddy daddy <laughs> i love this daddy bratty the sub kissinger <laughs> daddy the communists have taken my toys and by toys i mean their own resources but yeah their own shit <laughs> <laughs> so nixon declared that it was nsc policy to bring down allende <sighs> On September 11th, 1973, a military junta headed by Augusto Pinochet and backed by the CI motherfucking A staged a violent coup d'etat. Just before the presidential palace was captured, Allende broadcast a farewell speech to the citizens of Chile over the radio. Here is an abbreviated version of Allende's final speech. My friends, surely this will be the last opportunity for me to address you. The Air Force has bombed the antennas of Radio Mayanis. My words do not have bitterness, but disappointment. May they be a moral punishment for those who have betrayed their oath. Given these facts, the only thing left for me is to say to workers, I am not going to resign. Placed in a historic transition, I will pay for loyalty to the people with my life. And I say to them that I am certain that the seeds which we have planted in the good conscience of thousands and thousands of Chileans will not be shriveled forever. They have force and will be able to dominate us, but social processes can be arrested by neither crime nor force. History is ours, and people make history. The people must defend themselves, but they must not sacrifice themselves. The people must not let themselves be destroyed or riddled with bullets, 
but they cannot be humiliated either. Workers of my country, I have faith in Chile and its destiny. Other men will overcome this dark and bitter moment when treason seeks to prevail. Go forward knowing that sooner rather than later, the great avenues will open again and free men will walk through them to construct a better society. Long live Chile. Long live the people. Long live the workers. These are my last words, and I am certain that my sacrifice will not be in vain. I am certain that, at the very least, it will be a moral lesson that will punish felony, cowardice, and treason. So if that sounds like a suicide note, that's because it was. Allende chose to die by his own hands rather than be brought down by Pinochet's men. Juan Seoane, Allende's chief of bodyguard at the time, recalled Allende's final moments. Allende began to say goodbye to us one by one. He gave us a hug and told us, thank you for everything, comrade. Thank you for everything. And then he said that he was going to leave at last. He walked to the end of the line with his AK, turned around behind a wall, and then he shouted, Allende doesn't surrender. The shot was heard as 15 meters from where we were. The human rights abuses under Pinochet's 17-year regime are so extensive and grotesque that human rights abuses in Chile under Augusto Pinochet is its own Wikipedia article. <laughs> the most famous of them was Pinochet's official death squad, wittingly named the Caravan of Death. Those are the guys that were, yeah, those are the guys that were dumping bodies out of helicopters. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Sorry, just the, the caravan of death is giving death eaters. Like, it's just like, it's very <laughs> like, she's on the nose. Whoever wrote that yeah. did not have talent. It sounds like, it sounds like a haunted house. Like, let's all go down to the caravan of death. It's so spooky. Like a haunted but hay in, ride. And it was spooky, though. It was spooky, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's really spooky. The... They killed a lot of people. They were a state-sponsored terror gang that roamed the country, killing people to cross dissent. Yep. And Pinochet's regime instituted a number of concentration camps where inmates were subjected to torture techniques like la paria. I don't know why I said that like a French person. <laughs> like <laughs> la paria. It's the paria. <laughs> yeah. Paris. <laughs> la paria or the grill where a victim was stretched no. out naked on a metal bed frame and tortured oh. with electrical currents. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. Or they were subjected to good old-fashioned sexual abuse as torture. Military personnel not only raped women, but also employed foreign objects and even animals to inflict additional pain and suffering. <sighs> women, and occasionally men, reported incidents where spiders and live rats were implanted on their genitals. One woman testified that she had been raped and sexually assaulted with trained dogs and live rats and was forced to engage in sexual acts with her father and brother who were also <gasps> detained. The U.S. was handsomely rewarded for their help in establishing Pinochet's regi regime. Economists from the University of Chicago were invited to Chile to advise Pinochet on economic policy. And can you believe it? With their guidance, Pinochet implemented austerity measures, the destruction of organized labor, the privatization of state assets, abolition of wages and price controls, and deregulation of markets and multinational corporations were granted the rights to repatriate 100% of their profits. So, like, all the rapes were fine because corporations got to take their fucking copper back. Worked out well for us in the end. This is like... You couldn't... You couldn't write this without it sounding unrealistic because it's like nobody's that evil like that is like again unfathomable and yet i'm a realist in that now i'm a pessimist because i just heard this this is why u.s high school history textbooks are like and then we won World War II and nothing happened until 9-11. <laughs>
<laughs> Everything was good. There was another 9/11. 9/11 I there just wasn't... learned. <laughs> they actually a lot of people call this the other 9/11. Well, no, it came first. We should call. It did come first. Nine, we should call the other nine eleven. The other nine eleven two. <laughs> yeah, nine eleven two. <laughs> Not to be confused with nine. Two nine eleven two furious. <laughs> no. Oh God! Not I'm picturing cars like a like a, a second souped up Honda Civic has hit the World Trade Center. <laughs> Nor in 1974, Nixon was forced to resign over the Watergate scandal, which mm-hmm. will be a future episode. So I can tell you what that means. And Kissinger continued to serve under the administration of Gerald Ford, but he was replaced in his role as national security advisor. Kissinger would continue to serve as secretary of state within the Ford administration, backing Indonesian forces when they annexed East Timor in 1976 resulting in a genocide of roughly a quarter of the Timorese population. This is too many genocides. Yeah. Like, this is just, this is just, like, I thought when you said there was a lot of genocides, I pictured, like, two. Because two is a lot of genocides. (laughs) We've arguably hit, like, four. Yeah, I was about to say, is this four? (laughs) I think so. And there's, like, others that, like, we're just not going to talk about. Great, great. Mm -hmm. But when Jimmy Carter, the least bad of all American presidents, won the presidency in 1976, Kissinger resigned. He was like, a good guy, not on my watch. Fucking not. (laughs) We're just not going to vibe. No. He swiped left. But does that mean he stopped working in politics? Absolutely the fuck not. Never. No. (laughs) <laughs> he just went back to doing what he did before Nixon, serving as advisor to politicians and corporate entities, getting elected chairman of the board to various commissions and committees, and giving lots and lots and lots of interviews and enjoying lots and lots and lots of fame and influence. In 2019, this motherfucker was giving statements about the pros and cons of turning nuclear weapons control over to AI. <laughs> um for anyone that has seen the christmas and new year's specials i would have to say probably a bad idea vote of confidence sounds sounds perfect <laughs> great idea <laughs> to be fair like, he did mention cons he said there are some cons <laughs> But also, what was it pros. that he wasn't in control of it anymore? <laughs> I think it was. I I, I kind of <laughs> I glossed over it. Like when, I just skimmed it when I was reading. But it was basically like, yeah, you wouldn't have like human control over it. I guess that's kind of a con. But also, <laughs> is it not a pro? <laughs> Who's to say? Scholars remain divided on whether or not every toaster that you order should come with a nuclear warhead. <laughs> He was issuing statements to the media almost up till the moment he died. In October of 2023, he said the goals of Hamas, quote, can only be to mobilize the Arab world against Israel and to get off the track of peaceful negotiations. In response to alleged celebrations of the attack by some Arabs in Germany, he issued a statement denouncing Muslim immigration into Germany. Quote, it was a grave mistake to let in so many people of totally different culture and religion and concepts because it creates a pressure group inside each country that does that. (sighs) He's literally just doing, like, Breitbart news stuff, but with a Harvard education. Yeah, it's, there's, like, no difference between, like, what he is saying and what, like, Ollie London talks about. Yeah. He's just saying it like a smart guy. Where is he saying this? Like, who is he saying this to? Interviews with, like, Like, news Like, did he have a Twitter account? I don't think he I don't think he had an official Twitter account. I think he had a bunch of sock puppets that were tweeting things like actually working for Raytheon is like one of the only ways that like young queer people (laughs) can get healthcare. (laughs) Do better. (laughs) It's just Henry Kissinger being like, sorry, I forgot you don't fucking care about disabled queer people. 
Yeah. I just, my, my personal headcanon is that you can't, you can take the man out of psyops, but you can't take the psyops out of the man, you know? I've tried. Just because he stopped working for the CIC doesn't mean that he didn't have that CIC bug for the rest of his life. Yeah. Let's take another ad break. And when we return, I have a confession to make. Okay. Kaylin, I buried a lead. I buried a lead very, very, very deep in Ask Kissinger's Hole. Okay. During his time as Secretary of State, Mm -hmm. Henry Kissinger was perceived to be one of America's hottest male sex symbols. (laughs) Dude. (laughs) So who said this? (laughs) So many people. So many people. He was like, he was a hot Is that dusty old man on that book back there? So I'm going to show you, <laughs> I'm going to show you a picture of him when he was like young and when he was still secretary of state. Nerd to me. I'm not going to be attracted to a, se- a secretary. I mean, he That's is so not feminine. hot. <laughs> <laughs> where, where is it? Where, where did I you sent it, it in somewhere? WhatsApp. I was, oh, I have my phone muted. Okay. He looks like a fucking turnip. He was about to say a turkey. <laughs> he does. He's big. either way. He's been roasted. <laughs> yeah. He's Why? He's nasty. giving Roy Cohn. He is. He's got that same tan. That, 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 that like sixties tan. G- yeah. Get off the boat. <laughs> Stop lit- laying out on the 60s boat. Tan. <laughs> it's oh fucking nasty. God. This like, isn't when they said he was hot. He it is. That's when he was Secretary no. of State. When he was like in his forties. Do you have a photo of him in his like twenties or something? Like, um, I think. Are, okay. Did people just have like stars in their eyes because they knew what he looked like when he was younger? Because like I am not see, and you no. know, I, I, will I will send f- you the picture from his Wikipedia about uh, of him when he was like a Harvard senior, and it's there even like, worse, Kalen. There are worse. like eight men in their forties that I'm not attracted to. Like in the I world. know, and this is one of them. Also, <laughs> I have to say, he never lost his heavy German accent. So imagine that man talking to you with a German accent. So open up the Wikipedia link I just sent. There's a picture okay. of him as a Harvard grad in the yearbook. He's even worse when he's younger. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> he's so <laughs> ugly. Jump scare. No. Uh, I'm going to gasify him. He does so, need bu- buccal fat removal, I will say. He does. He has a lot of buccal fat. <sighs> Yeah. Maybe, yeah, if his cheekbones were a little bit more snatched, maybe I'd change yeah. my tone. Because uh, he tone. has a full head of hair. <laughs> Which is disgust. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what a, no. Like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at this little guy. <laughs> Ugliest smile. So in addition to courting and charming reporters, Henry Kissinger had a talent for courting and charming women. He'd been married twice, first to a fellow Firth native, Annalise Fleischer, with whom he'd had two children before the two divorced in 1964, and then to Rockefeller aide Nancy Magine in 1974, with whom he'd remained married for the rest of his life. But nonetheless, Kissinger was infamous for always being seen with beautiful women. He dated beautiful celebrities like, like beautiful, like he is beautiful. Like <laughs> he dated beautiful celebrities like Zsa Zsa Gabor, Shirley MacLaine and Jill St. James, the first American Bond girl. Like legitimately, he was dating like actresses fuck? and models. Yes. He was once... it the power or like, do we know if he was swanging? Well, like he. So. He had he has like a very famous quote where he says like power is the greatest aphrodisiac. So it's partly that it doesn't seem like like he casually dated these people. I don't know how many of them he actually had sex with. So I don't right. know if he was swanging. He'd once stood Zsa, Zsa Gabor up for a date with a message saying we're invading Cambodia tomorrow. <laughs> 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 Sorry, you can't come. Got to be up early to invade Cambodia. <laughs> What the fuck is that? Yeah. I know it wasn't a text message, 
but, but it's it funnier like if you if you yeah. if you picture it as one not the invasion just the idea of like like you want people to know it's like listen like this yeah. is a big thing that's going on but you you could just say He's, work we're invading like cambodia that's... tomorrow with like a little eye roll emoji like sorry you gotta be up gotta yeah. be up early invading cambodia <laughs> my boss tomorrow. wants me to come in early tomorrow to invade cambodia <laughs> I have to open the store, and by the store, I mean the invasion of <laughs> Cambodia. Kissinger earned himself a reputation as Washington's greatest swinger and the playboy of the Western wing. <laughs> like, what nasty. the fuck? He looks he like once, a foot. <laughs> he once asked a Washington Post reporter, Sally Quinn, why don't you think I'm a secret swinger? <sighs> Like, imagine being, like, reporting That's on, sexual harassment. like, the Washington... Be yes, it is. It's absolutely sexual harassment. <laughs> like, the fuck Which, off. <laughs> to be fair, it didn't exist in 1970. I actually don't think about your sex life at all. Like... A 1972 poll of Playboy bunnies ranked him as number one on a list of men I would most like to go on a date with. Okay, but to be fair, I feel like... That, like if you're gonna like if your sample group is like women who like are attracted to like old ass rich dudes um he's gonna like okay yeah he's gonna, he does have that you look. know what i mean like old -ass rich that, that is yeah. that is like a skewed sample size it's a, of yeah like, it's a skewed pool. if you're at the playboy mansion <laughs> like it's like oh yeah <laughs> i totally tight. get with this old dude <laughs> <laughs> like, whatever you say. In his memoir, head of Paramount Studios Robert Evans described Kissinger as Cary Grant with a German accent. Like, fuck he is. Come on. Robert Evans and Kissinger became good friends after a Hollywood dinner party. And in his memoirs, Evans recalled the conversation they'd had over the phone. Henry would say, the Israelis are really difficult to deal with, Robert. It's true. Then, you're having sex with Golden Meyer. Robert, I'm not that much of a patriot. Tell me, are Raquel's breasts for real? <sighs> We're invading Cambodia tomorrow. <laughs> what is Zsa Zsa's pussy like? I, all of the men that I hang out with are queer. And while they do talk like this, it's like much less startling when it's not when I'm not picturing like two gross 40 year old men like sitting at a table discussing. Discussing this so not even like blatantly, but so like what are her breasts like? Like it's <laughs> it sounds like two aliens first day on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> i heard human men like boobies <laughs> i Tell heard me, you like do they squish <laughs> like it's just so weird and like 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 sterile in a way like it's there's nothing yeah. sexy about it like it's just like yeah. very <laughs> i don't know that's nasty i'm gonna read some excerpts from a disgusting women's wear daily interview published in 1971 titled I wonder who's kissing now. Ew. Henry Kissinger. <laughs> Henry kissing Nar. <laughs> Henry kissing Nar. I don't want to think of Nar. <laughs> Henry Kissinger, sex symbol of the Nixon administration, steps mm -hmm. out of his office onto a sun-drenched San Clemente terrace <laughs> with, a, with a cup of black coffee and sits in a white deck chair with his legs crossed. What are you trying to do, seduce me? Henry will tease as he notices his visitor's hot pants. You know what? I like these hot pants very much. <laughs> then what is he'll, happening? Then he'll light your cigarette, touching your hand as all continentals do, offering you a cup of coffee and discuss trivia as readily as he could a Sino-Soviet entente. One cannot help but wonder if the movie stars mind that the ankle socks of Washington's greatest swinger are falling down, that his wiry chestnut hair, which flashes golden in the intense white sunlight, is too close-cropped to run their fingers through, 
or that at least 10 of his 178 pounds protrude over his thin black belt, somehow shortening his five feet, nine inches. But suddenly an electric twinkle will flash through the intense blue of his eyes. And one catches an inkling of that movie star magnetism, that special quality, which causes some people to call him cuddly Kissinger. Oh, <laughs> that whole thing was so sick. Like it was so horny, but in the worst way, do you not hornily talk about ankle socks. You dirty fuck. You sick freak. You nasty little troll. Like the, the talking about like just a little protrusion over his belt, over his belt. Like, she for was, like, me, this chubby guy with pube hair is so hot. I, like, <laughs> they're like it's so wiry, and you can't even run your fingers through it. I just I want it so bad. <laughs> like, why are we? Like, it's having like the exact opposite. Res- it's probably because I know about the genocides, <laughs> but like, I'm pretty sure. Like describing anyone like that. Okay, number one, ankle socks. Like, no. Falling down. How are they falling down? So his crusty heels are like popping out the bottom. <laughs> like, they're already at your ankle. Like, that's, oh God. This, who wrote this? What's their name? Are they still alive? It's from a Women's Wear Daily interview. Okay. Well, I blame women's for this. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Women, this is your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe less daily because your opinions are horrible. Like, I re- I'm i going to find out who wrote this and I'm going to write the most sternly worded letter. So we all know how the rest of the story goes. Around Thanksgiving we? weekend 2023, I injured a toe, broke a finger, and had an appendicitis requiring emergency surgery. And after enduring that ritual sacrifice on November 29th, 2023, Satan called his chief demon back home. You're all welcome, by the way. Oh, thank you. Kissinger was 100 years old and died in his home in Connecticut. Following the announcement of his death, his life and achievements were celebrated in statements issued by former and current heads of states around the globe, including Tony Blair, Benjamin Netanyahu, Vladimir Putin, George W. Bush, and Xi Jinping. The rogues gallery. I know. (laughs) Fucking. (laughs) So all that fucking sags. And I want to close out with a different story from the latter part of Henry Kissinger's life. In April of 2015, Henry Kissinger wrote a glowing promotional piece in Time magazine for a young tech startup who dropped out of Stanford to found a health technology company, Elizabeth Motherfucking Holmes. (laughs) In his article titled simply Elizabeth Holmes, Kissinger wrote, When I was introduced to Elizabeth by George Schultz, her plan sounded like an undergraduate's dream. I told her that she had only two prospects, total failure or vast success. There would be no middle ground. (laughs) Elizabeth's company, Theranos, would infamously turn out to be the former rather than the latter. (laughs) Later in 2015, the Wall Street Journal revealed that Theranos was actually just using third-party machines that were already on the market, and in 2022, (laughs) Elizabeth Holmes was convicted of defrauding her investors. But before she'd be exposed, Elizabeth Holmes would manage to take a whole lot of money from a whole lot of rich ghouls, including Henry Kissinger, who was a board member of Theranos. (laughs) Okay, I do love a scam. We know this. This Mm. is this is show canon. Shannon. (laughs) Oh, my God. I love her. (laughs) Doherty. (laughs) No. (laughs) I'm still mad at her, but like the, the idea that this scammer got scammed, like I love when a scammer gets scammed, like he was going and telling like everybody different stories, like she Kissingered him. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wasn't this like, this is about blood, right? 
Yes. Like blood yeah. testing? So okay. like, yeah, the idea was you could basically get like blood tests for like multiple diseases in like a machine that was like small enough to like fit in your own home. And like, I, I actually haven't read too much. This is just for rich people, Theranos. right? Like, Yeah. But she was actually just like... <laughs> taking blood samples and using like third like machines that already exist on the market and an article in jacobin titled elizabeth holmes swindled henry kissinger and we're not complaining read <laughs> <laughs> more than half of theranos's 700 million dollars in investor money came from the waltons and three other ultra wealthy fam families the coxes the oppenheimers and the devosses all four families were sold on the project by estate lawyer Daniel Mosley and his employer, Henry Kissinger. <laughs> Dr. Kissinger has mentioned, Mosley wrote in a 2014 email introduced as evidence in Holmes's trial, a couple of <laughs> other families with whom he has had a very long relationship as possible candidates for investors. As it turns out, the ripple effects of whatever Holmes whispered in the old war criminal's ear ended up accounting for more than three fifths of the money she raised over. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, Kissinger invested $3 million of his own money in Theranos before Elizabeth Holmes was revealed to be a fraud and an American hero. Free her. Yeah. <laughs> I love her. Any relation to Sherlock? Because, like, um, it is... Well, they're no. both geniuses. Well, okay, of, of course. Of course, of course. It's both I scammers. I think they're both, <laughs> they're both on the spectrum, right? Yes. Autistic Of, like, scammers. Queen. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that too. <laughs> Neurodivergent <laughs> icons. <laughs> I didn't realize lying was wrong. <laughs> I do. I do love the idea of, like defrauding your investors <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like am i supposed I asked to be them like to give me money and they did that's not yeah. what it's not my fault what they did don't I know do how wrong? to like not yeah. be lied to <laughs> well, like, an investment is a gamble and they were gambling yeah. on me not lying <laughs> and they lost <laughs> losers are just losers who lose <laughs> That is the second Lady Ballers reference in this Kissinger episode. I can't talk about my favorite movie. Uh, I just, I love, I love that he, or that she was like Robin Hooding, but like minus the giving back to the poor part. <laughs> she, she's like, I rob from the rich and I give to me. And that's the Who's only also reason now she's the rich. in prison. <laughs> they put her in prison because she was too powerful. She was threatening the wealthy. You only go to prison if you steal from the wealthy. <laughs> like, yeah. Nobody goes to sucks. prison for like, like. <laughs> for genocide? <if> Henry, <laughs> yeah. You don't go to prison for genocide, but you go to prison for like stealing a couple million dollars from a war criminal. Yeah. Like, for lying to a war criminal. Like, come on. <laughs> Which Fuck is off. like. Free I wonder if at any point she was like, like, I feel like I should feel bad about this, but like, God, these men suck. <laughs> I, I don't feel bad <laughs> if they gave money to me and they lost if they lost money it sounds like a fucking skill issue yeah sorry not sorry the cubans say there is no evil that lasts a hundred years nor a body that can endure it henry kissinger's body endured 100 years six months and two days may his suffering last for an eternity Aww. 